we are all tempted to put God in a box. Now, there's nothing new or profound about that statement. It's a metaphor that can mean different things, and preachers everywhere, including me, have said it often. But today's reading takes it to a new level. In 1 Kings, God in a box is not a metaphor. It is literal. And there are two very different boxes at the center of the story. And I mean rectangular, literal, physical boxes. A big box and a little box. Did you notice them in the reading? The big box, of course, is the temple that Solomon had an insatiable desire to build and finally achieved it. The little box is the Ark of the Covenant, something they've been schlepping around everywhere they've wandered since Mount Sinai. Well, schlepping is probably not the right word when we describe carrying the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark was considered so holy that even touching it the wrong way was instant death. There is a story in 2 Samuel 6 where the Ark was being transported by ox cart to a new place of worship and the oxen stumbled on uneven ground and the ark started to slip off the cart and the cart driver, Uzzah, touched it to steady it and he was struck dead. I won't try to exegete that Bible story this morning. We'll just let it sit right there. I won't even touch it, so to speak. But here's what I want to say. Both these boxes the big, big one and the little one, had the express purpose of housing the divine presence. One of those boxes, the little one, was built on God's explicit and detailed instructions. The other box, the big one, seems at best to be tolerated by God. We have a detailed biblical account of God giving the plans, details, and blueprint to Moses for building the Ark of the Covenant. We'll call it the covenant box to distinguish it from the temple box. In Exodus, God gave Moses a precise set of plans with measurements, a materials list, and building specs for making the covenant box and for constructing the tabernacle, a big portable tent that sheltered the covenant box whenever they camped out. In contrast, building the temple was King David's idea from the beginning. David went to God for permission, but it was only after he built himself a huge elaborate palace and then got embarrassed seeing God's tent sitting next to it. God denied David's application for a building permit on two major counts. Read about it in 2 Samuel 7. First, God said, Who am I to need a luxury cedar-paneled house to live in? In all these generations, I've traveled with the Israelites. Have I ever once asked for a permanent house to live in? Secondly, God said, if I let someone build me a house, it needs to be someone with less blood on their hands. You've fought too many wars and shed too much blood for you to be a worthy builder of the temple. Wait till Solomon grows up to be king and then we'll see. Later, David handed over the already drawn up blueprints to Solomon, saying, Here are the plans God gave me. Right, David. If we believe that God dictated those plans to David, we need to ignore the fact that God made it very clear he had no interest in a temple box. If these were God's detailed plans, Strange that the Bible tells us nothing about how or when God gave them. 
For the covenant box and tabernacle, we get the whole story of God laying out the blueprints before Moses. All we get here is David saying, here are the plans I drew up as God gave them to me. A safer assumption, I think, is that David projected God's inspiration on these plans after the fact. It was David who was obsessed about building a temple. And unsurprisingly, the floor plans and layout resemble other temples of that era in Phoenicia and Syria and elsewhere. I think we should always be suspicious if somebody tells us that God told them exactly how to do something that they have been aching to do for over 20 years. Now, all this doesn't mean that Solomon's temple served no useful purpose in Israel's religious life. But I do think we should be honest about how it came about. The closest God gets to blessing this project without really blessing the project are the two recorded instances where God spoke to Solomon. In 1 Kings 6, during construction, God says, about this house you are building, if you will walk in my statutes, obey my ordinances, and keep all my commandments, etc., I will live among the people of Israel and will not forsake them. And in 1 Kings 9, after the temple's dedication and after a long, beautiful, and maybe even heartfelt prayer by Solomon, God said to Solomon, I heard your prayer and plea. So I have consecrated this house and I will live in it. But only as long as you walk before me with integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all that I have commanded you. But if you turn aside from following me, I will cast this house out of my sight. Israel will become a taunt among all peoples. This house will become a heap of ruins. So according to scripture itself, God's acceptance of the temple box is ambivalent and conditional. And the biblical writers had other more subtle ways of casting judgment on Solomon and his project. When the temple was completed, chapter 6 of, verse, of 1 Kings ends with these words, Solomon was seven years in building it. And the very next words, chapter 7, verse 1, are Solomon was building his own house 13 years. A chapter and verse divisions did not exist in the original text. So readers of the Hebrew Bible always read these two sentences back to back as they were meant to be read. Solomon spent seven years building a house for God and he spent 13 years building his own house. Not a, exactly a resounding endorsement of Solomon. It also points out in the text that he used forced labor, slaves of his own Israelite people to get this work done. And didn't God warn the people when they first asked for a king way back in 1 Samuel? Kings will enrich themselves at your expense. They will make slaves out of your sons and daughters. Well, there it is, spelled out in Scripture. Solomon is exactly the king God warned them about. So what are we to make of all this? Is this just interesting ancient history? And it is that. But history that doesn't really impact our lives because we don't have a state religion with kings and temples. Or is there a message here for us? Now, just to be clear, I like boxes. And I mean the literal boxes that we use for worship. I am drawn to 
the physical beauty and symmetry, the aesthetic side of worship moves me. And I don't want to diminish that. The covenant box, for instance, was a beautiful piece of furniture. And although rarely seen, it was a tangible reminder and focal point of Hebrew worship. It had value. And the temple box was beautiful beyond compare. For those gathered in its courtyards and inner sanctums, it inspired awe and facilitated the worship of God in certain ways. I don't doubt that. I understand why structures like these become even larger than life because of how they move us emotionally and spiritually. Christian cathedrals work the same way. They inspire worship. They draw our minds and hearts toward the transcendent and we get attached to them. That's why the burning of the Notre Dame Cathedral a few years ago caused massive grief around the world and why crying people filled the streets of Paris. So yes, let us allow for and even affirm our human need to create beauty and permanence. But, and you knew there was going to be a yes but, but boxes have a shadow side. They create an illusion that we can contain God. They can obscure the fact that God is on the move in ways that we cannot predict or box in. They encourage us to think that we always know where God is and where God isn't. Let's look again at the differences between the two boxes in today's text. The temple box was inescapably associated with permanence, with wealth, with political and economic power, with worship rituals that could easily be corrupted, with a whole temple system that worked to maintain the status quo, that reinforced the power of the king whose palace was next door in the same compound. In stark contrast, the covenant box was meant to be carried. It had carrying poles attached to it at all times. And the articles and objects inside the covenant box were all symbols of a single time or a moment in Israel's history of wandering when God met them in a powerful way to provide for them in hardship and deliver them from bondage. It contained Aaron's rod that budded to recall their miraculous escape from Egypt. It had a jar of manna to recall God's generous provision in a time of need in the desert. It had two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments to help them remember that relational covenant they had with Yahweh. All of these were reminders of God's faithfulness to God's people who were on the move because God was on the move. They inspired not permanence and power and wealth, they inspired dependence and trust and faith in God's enough. So how do the boxes that we still build for God today compare? And this sermon is by no means anti-box or anti-building or even anti-cathedral. The question is, how do we relate to the boxes we build? Are we trying to squeeze God to fit entirely inside our boxes so that we always know where to find God in our box, in our words, with our rituals, 
so that we don't have to be anxious if God seems absent and we can always return to our box and find God there. And at what point then do we start to slip from the worship of God to the worship of the box? I think it's fitting that this week, Sam Petersheim and a friend are heading down to New Orleans Ninth Ward on our behalf in order to help repair the roof of the box we helped to build for our sisters and brothers at Christian Baptist Church. That box, as simple and unadorned as it may be, is highly important to that little community and their life of worship. I'm glad we helped them rebuild it years ago and are still helping them to maintain it. But the God in a box temptation is a temptation for every church, for Parkview Mennonite and for Christian Baptist Church. And it's a temptation for every religion, not just our own. It's a temptation both for the literal boxes or sanctuaries that we build and the metaphorical boxes that we create ourselves to hold our experience of God. We create boxes for God so that we know where to find God and where to worship God. But then we're immediately tempted to limit God to that box. God is on the move still. And God wants to move in tandem with us. God's first desire still is to make our boxes portable like the covenant box. Not meaning literal movable tents necessarily, but committing ourselves to be a church on the move. Not a church that worships a God that we have somehow nailed down to one place and one tradition. May God give us the insight and courage to be people of the covenant box. Never forgetting our need to follow wherever God is moving.